Welcome to the Antiquities Travel Guide. Follow us to different countries as we search for ancient artifacts. If you too wish to explore the ancient past through travel, we'll help you plan where to go, what to see, and how to best enjoy what you encounter. In this series of the ATG, you can accompany Marisa and me on our trek through England, homeland of the ancient Angles, Saxons, Romans, and Celtic Britons. Come on, let's go. We're here in Carlisle this morning. We're gonna get some breakfast and then we're off to Ribchester, to the Ribchester Museum. And uh, we're gonna to go to Liverpool, to the World Museum there. And then we're gonna finish off the day by going to Roxeter Roman City, which is another cool archeological site. This leg of our road trip took us to the picturesque village of Ribchester in Lancashire County, which lies on the banks of the River Ribble. A quaint little museum can be found there, which Marisa and I visited as we were making our way southward. The museum has been there since 1914, though it underwent a remodel in 2002. So we're here at Ribchester, formerly known as Bremetonacum. Behind me, you can find the museum, which contains the artifacts from the old Roman fort. The exhibits chronicle the history of the area, stretching back to the Stone Age. They have a number of well-preserved Bronze Age artifacts, in addition to Roman material. It's a category three, so you can see everything in about 30 to 60 minutes, depending on your pace. Why put an ancient history museum in Ribchester? Well, not only has this site been inhabited since prehistoric times, but it was the location of an important Roman fort called Remitinacum Veteranorum, which was established as a turf and timber structure in the early 70s CE to protect the river and the intersection of Roman roads coming from Deva Victrix, Chester, Eboricum, York, and Luguvalium, Carlisle, where we just came from. The original garrison consisted of 500 cavalrymen from northern Spain. Within a century, the fort was rebuilt in stone and the old garrison was replaced by a unit of Sarmatians. They came from what is now Hungary. As with most Roman forts, a vicus or civilian settlement grew up around the fort. Within a few decades of its establishment, the settlement here at Remitinacum became the Roman administrative center for the region. Its heyday was in the second century. The famous Ribchester Horde was discovered here but not by an archaeologist. In 1796, the young son of a clog maker was playing behind his house when he unearthed a wooden box full of military items and cavalry gear. Its location was under the remains of a barrack house. It was probably owned by a soldier, living circa 120 CE. The stash contained eye guards for a horse, pottery bowls, saddle plates, a good luck amulet made from a boar's tusk, but most impressive was this decorative visor helmet, probably a part of fancy dress worn in cavalry sporting events. All the items are not here at Ribchester, but over at the British Museum. And even though he made this great discovery, the clogmaker's son still was forced to wear clogs. Every July, the museum sponsors a Roman reenactment featuring demonstrations of Roman military engagements and daily life. Right outside the museum, and next to the parish church of St. Wilfrid's, you can see the remains of the fort's Roman granaries. We walked along a footpath next to the river in search of the ruins of the bathhouse. We found them at the end of the path, right next to the White Bull pub. They're off the museum grounds, but admission is free. There wasn't much to look at other than some of the foundations but we had the place to ourselves. Then it was back in the car as we made our way to Liverpool. If I were a music historian, I might have gone there for different reasons, but for us, the World Museum was our destination. For ancient history, and for Egypt in particular, the World Museum has one of the best exhibits in the country. They are said to have more than 16,000 artifacts from ancient Egypt and Nubia, covering prehistoric times all the way to the Byzantine period. 
They had for a long time the second largest collection of Egyptian antiquities next to the British Museum, but during World War II, a bomb fell on the museum and destroyed over 3,000 artifacts. They've rebuilt the collection since, and now have even more than they started with. The museum is very kid-friendly, and the young ones will probably love all the mummies and coffins on display. There's a very well-preserved copy of the Egyptian Book of the Dead here. Now, I don't know if you know what the Egyptian Book of the Dead is, but it dates to around the time of the New Kingdom. There's no definitive version of it. In fact, no two are alike. They were individualized. But basically, it's a book of spells that were thought would be of help to a deceased person on their journey into the afterlife. The book, which is usually written on papyrus, is based on the coffin texts from the Middle Kingdom, which were placed, as their name suggests, directly onto the coffins of the dead. The coffin texts, in turn, were based on the pyramid texts of the Old Kingdom, found on the walls of pyramids. The spells you see were originally made for the king, but as time passed, everybody wanted spells of their own. We next drove to Roxeter in Shropshire to visit the ruins of Old Roman Viraconium Carnoviorum, or just Viraconium for short. The name was derived from Britannic Celtic Viraconion, an important city of the natives nearby, which means place of the man-wolf. And if you're wondering, yes, it's an early form of the word werewolf, Wiraconion, though I don't know of any specific legend associated with this site. We're here at Roxeter, which is the fourth largest city here in Roman Britain. It contained about 5,000 people and had about 47 blocks. Just to give you an idea of how big this place really was, it was about 180 acres. The site was one of the first in Britain to be opened up to tourists. Currently, English Heritage owns most of the area and leases out much of it to local farmers. Most of the old town still hasn't been excavated. But because it never was occupied after Roman times, it's easier to see the layout of the Roman city than at a number of other sites. There's a shop and a small museum here, but we were so interested in the ruins that by the time we got back, the center was closing and we only got to see it for a couple of minutes. We've come far enough south again that we are in the territory that the Romans were conquering in the late 40s and early 50s CE. The region was inhabited by the Cornovii tribe, now, there was actually more than one of those, but this is the one that was in the Midlands. An auxiliary fort was built there by the Romans around that time. Around 58, it was strengthened into a full-fledged fort and was used as a base from which to invade Wales. Around 30 years after that, once a vicus had grown around the fort and the fighting in the area had died down, the civilian authorities took control and they were given a certain amount of local autonomy. The city prospered in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, becoming a civitas capital. Many public buildings were erected then. The last great phase of expansion here at Viraconium was the Great Basilica, which was built here. And you can see the, where the bottoms of the pillars were going down. This was a massive building here. And the bathhouse over here, the wall of which you can see on my right. The bath and forum occupied the equivalent of two entire city blocks. To supply water to the bath complex, they built a V-shaped aqueduct channel that ran from one of the tributary streams of the Severn River to the city. An inscription on the bathhouse read, for the good of the state. What we are looking at here is the last remaining wall of the bathhouse here at Roxeter. The Frigidarium was right here on the other side, the cold room of the bathhouse. And this is only one of three substantial portions of Roman wall still standing in England today. The other two would be the Jewry Wall in Leicester, which we saw the other day, and the Mint Wall in Lincoln, which we haven't seen. But whereas the Jewry Wall and the Mint Wall were incorporated into the later medieval towns, this wall here at Roxeter sits out in the cornfields just like it did back in Roman times.
This area was an open courtyard between the main buildings of the baths. This was an open-air bathing pool, or natatio in Latin, which was a bit unusual in Roman Britain. Adjoining the baths, there was a large public lavatorium and a square indoor market. The streets of the city were laid out in a neat grid pattern, and near the center of town were the homes of the rich, whose houses might contain up to 20 rooms just on the ground floor. Some of them had their own private baths and flushing toilets. In 2010, English Heritage teamed up with Channel 4 TV and they reconstructed an actual Roman villa for their documentary, Rome Wasn't Built in a Day. And I thought I would show you a uh, little bit of the place so you can get an idea of what a Roman villa was like. When making this villa, the modern builders made a point of trying to use only Roman methods for building and only the materials that they used back then. In the fourth century, during the times of political turmoil and the growing strength of anti-Roman forces, the city went into decline, losing much of its population. Many of the great buildings stood abandoned. Then in 408, the last of the Roman troops was withdrawn from Britain. Two years later, the Emperor Honorius wrote to Viraconium and the other cities on the island, informing them that from now on, they would be on their own. They say that after that, the area was taken by a local chieftain who may be one of the rulers on whom the King Arthur legend was based. Indeed, it's been speculated that Viraconium was the model for Camelot. Right next to Roxeter is the city of Shrewsbury, which is a really beautiful town. We stopped off at a place called Momo and had some ramen for dinner. Then it was to the Lion Hotel, which is in a really cute section of town. From what I hear, the building goes back to the 16th century. It's really cute and old fashioned inside. The elevator was broken, so we had to lug our luggage up the stairs ourselves, and they were quite windy. But overall, it was a pleasant stay. That was some day, but you know what? We've got so much more to see. In the next episode, We'll be making our way down to Oxford, where we will be visiting the Ashmolean Museum, and we'll be visiting some ancient ruins on the way. So we'll see you then. Thanks for watching. <laughs>